Hello. Uh, this is a video on hand calculations for framed structures and for uh, Virendil girders. Uh, this is the third video in a series and will only really make sense if the previous videos have been worked through. Uh, the overall aim of the series of videos is to show how to carry out an approximate analysis of a multi-storey frame and a Virendil girder. So uh, good luck to you and to me making the videos. <laughs> Right, uh, so previously we've looked at um, preliminary analysis hand calcs for a stiff beam frame and for a frame with constant EI and with pinned feet, just single storey frame. And this time we're going to look at a frame with constant EI, that's uh, similarly stiff members, but this time it has fixed feet. So um, off we go. So this is what the frame looks like. So we've now got fixed feet instead of pinned feet here and this is a, a rectangular portal. So this is a very similar approach to the frame with pinned feet. The key difference is the way that the columns behave uh, because uh, it's kind of one thing leads to another. Uh, that's, what, that's what people say, isn't it? One thing leads to another. So, so firstly, uh, because the bases are fixed, uh, these columns can develop bending moments at their bases. That means that they can have, they're fixed at the top to the adjacent beam, and they're fixed at the bottom. Uh, they're likely that the frame is likely to move slightly over to the to the right. Therefore, uh, this allows a, a point of contraflexure to develop somewhere near the middle of the column. Uh, once you have a point of contraflexure, this allows you to introduce a pin into a model. Once you have pins in a model, it makes it much easier to subdivide a model into small sections, which can be easy to analyze. Woohoo! Uh, so uh, it's good to do things that are easy. Uh, so let's, that allows us to break up this frame into smaller subframes. Okay, so subdividing complex models into smaller ones uh, is an approach that's often used in hand calcs. Uh, we create uh, new free body diagrams that we can analyze and we can combine these uh, uh, analysis results if we like. So for instance, when we look at the method of joints in triangulated structures, we create little free body diagrams at each joint. Uh, and when we similarly when we look at the method of sections uh, equally when we're just carrying out bending moment uh, analysis of a beam or working out the shear in a beam we often uh, create little little um, substructures and free body diagrams that we analyze uh, pins are a good place to to put our cuts because at a pin we know that the bending moment is zero and that gives us one less thing to worry about we don't have to worry about bending moments exposed at pins when we create cuts in structures. Uh, so let's have a look at this frame and uh, we have a method for, for analysing frames which we've used in previous um, previous examples and that is that we, we, uh, we consider the uh, stiffness of the, um, the joints and that allows us to consider the size of horizontal reactions at the base of the columns, so the stiffness of the columns, joints, and then consider the um, reactions at the bases. Well, in this this frame, both of the columns are just fixed to a single beam, therefore we're expecting them to be equally stiff. There we go. It's a bit of an easy one. But, uh, once we've decided on that, uh, we can look at our frame, and we can say that uh, if we have a force of P applied at the uh, the left hand side, then uh, that's going to be uh, P over 2 and P over 2 at uh, horizontal reactions uh, heading leftwards. Right. So now we have this column and it's, uh, it's fixed at top and fixed at bottom and the, the top is going to move rightwards relative to the bottom. I'll do it here, it's a bit easier to see. And there, there we have this kind of S shape in the column which means that the bending moment uh, there's tension in the column on this face, tension on this face. The bending moment diagram is going to change uh, sign from this side. It'll start off very large, it'll go down to zero, then it'll grow again here. So we know that we can have a point of contraflexure at the centre where the bending moment is zero at the point of contraflexure. So actually there's a there's similarly uh, points of contraflexure at the um, in the uh, columns and similarly there's a point of contraflexure in the uh, beam. We've looked at that already uh, in the previous video. 
race. So uh, we've said p here, p over two, p over two. So now, if we want to, we can actually uh, we can consider where bending moments are likely to occur. We can we can look at this and say, ah, we have a uh, we have a frame, and here's the frame. It's um, it's being pushed over to the right hand side. So as this is opening up, we're going to get tension in that corner and tension on the outside face. So tension on the inner face of the joint that opens, tension on the outside face of the joint that closes. And there we are. That's where we'd expect. Oops. Uh, that's not, that frame's not quite right, is it? That should be fixed. There we are. And that's fixed. Therefore, I'd expect tension on these faces as the, joint, as the, the frame bends over. Right, haha, <laughs> so here we are, tension on, uh, tension there, tension, tension, tension everywhere, no oh dear, it's life. Uh, so now we can think about where the bending moment would be drawn, it'll be approximately like this, we know we've just got this point load, we're considering the shear at the pins, these artificial pins that we've introduced, and uh, we know it's going to be greatest at the supports, because we've modelled this in the past as simply point loads applied to uh, cantilevers. Right. But uh, at the start, I said that one of the good things about uh, this uh, having uh, pins in the structure is that we can create, uh, uh, we can split the structure up. So there's a really convenient way to split this structure up, and we could say, let's 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 draw out this as a separate frame. So we'll keep this as this upper frame here. We'll look at that first, and then we can look at the lower frame. Well, the lower frame is incredibly simple. It's just simple vertical cantilevers. So let's see if we can uh, have a look at this upper frame. Oh, there we go. There's a, there are the two frames uh, split up. The upper frame, which has got uh, the horizontal load of P and two restraints, uh, which are the internal shears at the center of the beam at the points of uh, contraflexure at these pins, which we've introduced. Well, we've got P heading to the right. There must be P over two heading to the left. And that's also in accordance with uh, the uh, original diagram that we drew here. So we said that we've got P here equals equals, and the shear in each of these columns must be P over 2 in each column for the whole, whole, whole height of the column, right down to the foundations. Right, so once we've got this frame here, this upper frame, which we can focus on first, that looks remarkably similar to the pinned frame that we looked at in the previous video. It's virtually the same. We can we can model that leg as um, a cantilever, a vertical cantilever fixed at the top because it's fixed at this joint here uh, and we can say that we have a load of P over 2 applied over a length H over 2 and we can work out the bending moment at that point. Uh, we already understand about joints opening and closing and where to draw bending moments and how bending moments at joints are uh, are the same for the leg as they are for the uh, beam. So this allows us to draw this bending moment diagram. And we draw this because we know, uh, so for instance, P over 2 is the internal shear exposed at the pin, and H over 2 is the length of member, therefore the bending moment is P over 2 times H over 2, which is PH over 4. We know it's drawn here because that's where the tension is. So this is the top half of the frame. The bottom half of the frame even simpler. We simply have this internal shear of P over 2 acting at a height of H over 2 above the, um, the fixed base and this is the uh, so, so the bottom half of the frame. We just develop a bending moment of P over 2 times H over 2 which is PH over 4. And then we combine uh, the two frames together and the bending moments to create the final bending moment diagram. That's it. It's as simple as that. So with a frame with fixed feet it's quite convenient to split it into uh, an upper part and a lower part. So we typically, uh, at points of contraflexure, we look at the upper part uh, by creating pins and splitting the frame into a subframe, and then we look at the lower part like this. Okay, how about the next frame? This is a two-bay frame with uh, portal with fixed feet. What's the difference? The key difference is that when we're considering the stiffnesses of the columns to calculate the reactions, the central column must be treated differently to the outer columns. 
and that's because it's twice as stiff. This has got two hands on the handlebars, this has got one hand on the handlebars. So if this is twice as stiff, it attracts twice the load, therefore twice the reaction. So we've got a force of P applied to the frame, we're going to have P over 2, P over 4, P over 4. Okay, uh, we can look at this again and we consider that each of the legs or beams is fixed at each end and can develop bending moments which are going to be in opposite directions. We are going to develop points of, oh my god, points of contraflexure. So we've got points of contraflexure in each of these positions. Once we've got these points of contraflexure, we can then either think about where the bending moment is going to be drawn, always on the tension face, or we can think about splitting this frame up. So you might split the frame up along those three points of contraflexure to have an upper frame, and these three points of contraflexure to have a lower frame. I know it's probably the simplest thing to do. And when we calculate the whole thing out, uh, we end up with uh, a bending moment diagram that's going to be shaped like this. Um, we know that uh, we don't we don't know the size of the, these forces and bending moments yet, but it didn't take a minute to, to work them out. Let's have a look at the upper frame. <coughs> so if I know that the that the base reaction here is P, oh, I'll do it on this one. Uh, is P over four, then the internal shearing this this column is also going to be P over four for its full height. This height there is H over two, therefore the bending moment in this column at its top is P over 4 times H over 2, pH over 8. For this column it's going to be P over 2 times H over 2, pH over 4, and for this column it'll be the same as the other one, pH over 8. Okay. What about the beams? Well we know that the size of the bending moment in the beam here is equal to the size of the bending moment in the column. So once we've got that and we know where to draw the bending moment, we can crack on and draw the um, bending moment diagram. And there is the bending moment diagram for the uh, frame. Uh, there we are, so pH over 8 for the leg and the beam, pH over 8 for the leg, uh, for the beam, pH over 8 for the leg and the beam, pH over 8 for the beam. And for the central column we have pH over 4. Let's have a little closer look at that, that T shape there at the dead centre. So let's have a look at this this tiny little joint there. What I've said is that we have pH over 8 in the beam going anti-clockwise, pH over 8 in the right hand beam going anti-clockwise and they must be resisted. So we've got pH over 8 going anti-clockwise, pH over 8 going anti-clockwise, but they must be resisted by the the bending moment in the column, which in this case is pH over 4 and is running clockwise. So these do all add up. So that when I take moments around this point, uh, it, the sum of all these moments comes to zero. So that's why I'm happy with the results that I've got here. Uh, so much for the upper, upper frame. Let's have a look at the lower frame now. Oh, let's not look, have a look at the lower frame now. Let's just combine everything together. So there, there it is. We know that the bending moment at the top is going to be the same as the bottom because the cut was made at the centre. So there we are. That's the bending moment diagram for the entire structure. Here's an exercise now for you to have a, have a go at. So we looked at a two bay frame. Why don't you try a three bay frame? So point load, three bays, height of five metres. That's it. So I'm going to reveal the, uh, the answer now. So you need to pause the video if you can have a crack at this. And there's the answer. So that's okay. So, so now what I'd like to say is that we're one, one step closer to being able to analyze a multi-story frame structure or a Vindio girder. Uh, don't forget to have a go at the exercises and thank you for watching.